Hello, my fellow seekers of greatness. Today I want to take you on a journey, a journey of discovery, empowerment, and transformation. A journey that will challenge the limits you've placed on yourself and propel you towards heights you never thought possible. Welcome to a conversation about overcoming limits and unleashing the full extent of your potential through powerful habits that defy belief. Think for a moment about the barriers that stand between you and your aspiration. Perhaps it's self-doubt, fear of failure, or simply the inertia of complacency. Whatever form they may take, these limits have a way of holding us back, preventing us from reaching our truest selves and realizing our boldest dream. But here's the good news. You have within you the power to transcend these limits. And it all starts with the cultivation of powerful habits. Small, yet consistent actions that have the extraordinary ability to reshape your reality and propel you towards greatness. In the next few moments, we'll explore the stories of individuals who have defied the odds, shattered their own limitations, and achieved remarkable success through the power of habit. From athletes who have pushed past physical boundaries to entrepreneurs who have revolutionized entire industries, their stories serve as testaments to the transformative potential of habit. But before we delve into their journeys, I want you to take a moment to reflect on your own life. What are the limits that hold you back? What habits do you currently possess that either reinforce those limits or propel you towards your goals? And most importantly, are you ready to embrace the power within you to break free from those constraints and achieve the extraordinary? So my friends, fasten your seatbelts and prepare for a journey of self-discovery and empowerment. Together we will uncover the powerful habits that will take you beyond belief and pave the way for a life of limitless possibility. Are you ready to embark on this adventure? Let's dive in. Five reasons why you're not achieving success and how to overcome them. Brian Tracy, we've all been there feeling like we're not reaching success. The most common reason why many people don't achieve success is that we haven't defined what success is for us. To get to where you want to be, you must determine your end point and work backward to outline the steps from that point to where you are now. That's why it's so important to set goals. Setting goals gives you both a long-term vision and a short-term focus. Throughout my years, I found some common reasons why people don't achieve success. And almost all of these struggles happen because they don't see goal setting as a solution. You're trying to achieve something and not setting a goal. So I invite you to stick around until the end of this material that I've prepared, especially for you. In this video, you're going to learn the reasons why you're probably not achieving success and how to overcome them. We've all been there feeling motivated to work towards our goals, but then failing along the way. Not reaching a goal can be discouraging and can deter from setting other meaningful goals. However, instead of feeling discouraged when I don't reach a goal, I immediately take some time and reflect on why I didn't achieve that goal so I can learn and grow from the experience. Generally, setting SMART goals is the best way to ensure that we reach our goals, and there are some simple steps we can take to set better goals and then achieve them. Here are five reasons why you might not be achieving your goals and the best ways to address those issues. 1. Your goals are too vague. Many times people set goals that are too vague. You might think, I'd like to get in shape, or it would be great to have more money in my savings account. And sure, that would be great. But unless you describe your goals more specifically, you probably won't reach them. Specific goals are helpful because when you explain exactly what you want to do, it's easier to imagine yourself doing it and then actually follow through. Instead of saying, I want to get in shape, try saying, I will exercise three days a week and stop drinking sodas. So, your goal has transformed from something vague you'd like to do into something concrete and specific you're going to do. Two, you're not quantifying your goals. A common mistake when it comes to setting goals is that your goals aren't measurable. You should value your goal and measure your progress. Otherwise, it's probably a good idea to revisit and modify your overall goal. For example, if you said, my goal is to save more money, it's difficult to measure. What does more mean? That goal can be interpreted in many different ways and could pat me on the back for saving dollar, when in reality, one dollar can't buy much at all. But if I said my goal is to save $5,000 by this summer, it's easy to track that progress. I can regularly check my bank account to see how close I am to that $5,000 mark. And along the way, I stay motivated because I see how close I am to that goal. I encourage you to do the same. Three, you're setting unattainable goals. Setting goals is exciting. 
You might have big plans like becoming a millionaire or building your dream home. But if you set the bar too high, you're not going to reach your goals and you'll feel disappointed in yourself and exhausted. An easy way to combat this is by setting goals that are attainable. For example, let's say I want to build my dream home. Saying I want to build a new home for my family in the next six months probably isn't an attainable goal. Building a house takes time, so a more realistic goal could be I will research contractors and get a quote. Once I've achieved that goal, I can think about the rest of the process and decide what the next realistic goal might be. You see the difference? Or, you're setting goals that are irrelevant to your life. Sure, you might like the idea of moving to New York City or the Caribbean, but is that goal really relevant to your life? Achieving that goal might be fun, but if it doesn't move you further along the path of your overall plan for your life, it really wasn't worth it. That's why I always make sure my goals aren't a waste of time. Every goal should have a purpose behind it to help make it relevant. Instead of moving to the Caribbean just because the blue water looks nice, a better goal might be, I want to move to such a city because there are many job opportunities there in my industry. When I set goals, I always make sure they're relevant to my life. Five, you're not adding a time frame requirement. Adding a deadline to each goal you set is essential. When you add a deadline to your goals, you'll be much more motivated to work towards them and ensure you reach them before the time period ends. What does this look like? It's simple. Instead of saying, I want to hire two more employees for my company, say, I want to hire two more employees for my company within three months. Then you'll be more motivated to pursue and achieve that goal. To ensure I reach goals, I give myself realistic deadlines. These help me keep my goals aligned and within reach. But let me ask you, have you ever set a goal that you couldn't reach? What was it? And how could you have made it more achievable? If you're ready to start setting better goals, you're in luck. Remember, you have the ability to set and achieve any goal. To succeed, know that you must set goals, but reaching them is where the real work begins. If you've tried and failed to reach your goals in the past, it's easy to become discouraged. Perhaps you've started to wonder if you're not the type of person who can easily achieve goals. But the truth is, anyone can learn techniques that will allow them to reach any goal they set. As beloved novelist C. Lewis said, you are never too old to set a new goal or dream a new dream. This encouraging thought rings true today and especially for you who have decided to pursue your goals. So today I'm going to share some of my secrets for achieving goals that I've developed over my 30 years of business experience. Take a moment to congratulate yourself for coming this far. You've taken the first and most important step towards improving your life and goal setting skills. Success is not an action you take, it's a way of life. If you want to achieve great things, greatness must be reflected in everything you do. Therefore, regardless of what you want to achieve, the path to success must begin by adopting the right mindset. The following are five tips for developing the perfect mindset for success. But before sharing these five tips, let me recommend a training that complements this video which has changed the lives of many people. This training will teach you to have a mindset of wealth and abundance in just 21 days. We'll leave the link to the training in the video description. Now, without further ado, here are the five tips for developing the perfect mindset for success. 1. Define what success means. The first step in building a mindset for success is defining what it means to be successful. Setting goals for yourself makes it easier to craft an action plan to achieve your ambitions and will motivate you to carry out that plan. It also provides you with a standard against which to measure your progress and adjust your strategy. Therefore, you should define life or professional goals and then think about what you need to do to achieve them. By setting smart goals in every area of your life that you want to change. Additionally, create short-term goals every day or week, ensuring they align with your broader goals. Two, stay in touch with your intuition. The second step to building a mindset for success is staying in touch with your intuition. Many assume that success means making calculated decisions based on empirical data. While you should strive to be as empirical as possible, such data isn't always available. Regardless of your specific path, you're likely to encounter a decision at some point in your life or career where there isn't a calculable answer. In this situation, you must be able to listen to your intuition. Although not a perfect source of information, our intuitions can often solve problems more quickly than conscious thought. 
This will enable you to make decisive decisions in challenging situations. Three, always maintain a positive attitude. Never underestimate the value of a positive attitude towards achieving your goals. Regardless of the path you take, it can be easy to become discouraged by setbacks or temporary failures in achieving specific goals. Positive thinking means identifying these setbacks as learning opportunities. This makes it easier to overcome small failures and keep striving to achieve your goals. Positive thinking also tends to make you a more likable person, allowing you to attract support from others who can help you along the way. 4. Take action. You need to translate your thoughts into action. In addition to positive thoughts, a mindset for success also requires that your thinking be productive. Whenever you're contemplating your goals or obstacles to achieving them, you should be able to identify clear actions you can take in response. The more easily you can transfer an idea or desire into practical action, the easier it will be to move towards your goals. 5. Assume complete responsibility. A mindset for success means being able to take responsibility for everything you do, whether good or bad. If you make a mistake or harm someone along the way, assuming responsibility allows you to contain the damage and preserve your reputation. It also encourages you to think about how you might avoid that mistake in the future. Similarly, if you achieve something, you should take credit for it. Only then will others realize what you're capable of and support you on your path to success. The millionaire mindset for achieving financial independence. There is plenty of money for all those who know how to acquire it and keep it. We live in an abundant universe where there is enough money for all those who truly desire it and are willing to obey the laws that govern its acquisition. You can have everything you want. There is plenty of money available to you. There is no real scarcity. You can have virtually everything you truly desire and need. We live in a generous universe and are surrounded on all sides by blessings and opportunities to acquire everything we truly desire. Your attitude, whether of abundance or scarcity towards money, will have a significant impact on whether you'll become rich or not. Make a decision. The first corollary of the law of abundance states that people become rich because they decide to become rich. They become rich because they believe they have the ability to become rich. Because they believe this wholeheartedly, they act accordingly, consistently, taking the necessary actions that turn their beliefs into realities. And you can always know what your beliefs truly are by observing your actions. There's no other way. The second corollary of this law says, people are poor because they haven't yet decided to become rich. Examine your own thinking. In Mark Fisher's book, The Instant Millionaire, the old millionaire asked the young man seeking advice on becoming a millionaire. Why aren't you already rich? This is an important question you should ask yourself. How you answer this question will reveal a lot about yourself. Your answers will expose your self-limiting beliefs, doubts, fears, excuses, rationalizations, and justifications. Additionally, you should review your reasons why you're not already rich. Write down all the reasons that come to mind. Go through your answers one by one with someone who knows you well and ask for their opinion. You may be surprised to discover that your reasons are mostly excuses you've fallen in love with. Whatever your reasons or excuses, you can overcome them. The world is full of hundreds and thousands of people who have overcome far greater difficulties than you could imagine and still succeeded. You can too. Your goal in life is to be a great success. Achieve wonderful things as you become stronger, improve with each passing day and week, and ultimately develop your full potential as a person in everything you do. The good news is that there has never been a better time in all of human history for you to achieve your goals and achieve great success than today, right here, right now, wherever you live and whatever you are doing. We are entering what many economists call the golden age of human history, a period of peace and prosperity that has been dreamed of through all ages of man. And you're at the forefront. You are perfectly positioned to maximize your potential and get everything possible out of the unlimited opportunities now opening up around you. The key to great success has always been contained in the principle of leverage. It is your ability to leverage your talents and abilities as a multiplication sign through other people, enabling you to achieve extraordinary things in a short period of time. Men and women who achieve a lot have learned to leverage themselves in various ways and in various directions. And there is no place where leverage is more important than in your ability to influence others in such a way that they help you get the things you want, while at the same time helping themselves get the things they want. One of the great laws of life is the law of reciprocity. This law says that people always try to repay you for everything you do. In a positive sense, it means that every time you do something good for someone else, 
you create in them a sense of obligation. Since no one likes to be obligated to another person, they will do everything they can to get rid of that feeling of obligation by returning the favor, usually giving much more than what you initially contributed. For example, about five years ago, I bought a new car. At the end of the transaction, the sales manager instructed one of his employees to take me in the car to a nearby gas station and fill up the tank. In all my years of buying new and used cars, I had never had someone fill up the gas tank for me at the end of the transaction. Two years later, I went back to the same dealership and the same sales manager and bought another new car for my wife. I wanted to reciprocate with a $1.20 tank of gas. It led to a $45,000 purchase. And this is one of the great discoveries regarding the law of reciprocity, repayment. When you do something good for someone else, it can be disproportionate in relation to the size of the effort or expense you've made. One of the great principles of success practiced by all highly influential men and women is this. The more you give of yourself without expecting anything in return, the more you will receive from the most unexpected sources. Throughout all ages of man, this has been known as the law of sowing and reaping, the law of cause and effect, or even the law of action and reaction. It says that whatever you put in, you'll get out. It also says that you can plant a small seed and often reap an entire harvest. The wisest men and women in our society always look for opportunities to contribute to others, knowing that they are sowing seeds that will reap in the form of power, influence, and others desire to cooperate and help them at a later time. On the other hand, people who seem to get nowhere in their lives and careers are always the ones trying to take something before putting it in. As the song goes, they put in a penny and want a dollar's worth of music. But this isn't for you. Your job is to maximize yourself and your potential throughout your life. And this requires intelligent and deliberate cultivation of people at all levels, doing things for them so that they are predisposed to reciprocate and do things for you when you need and want their help. Dwight D. Eisenhower once said, Leadership is the ability to get people to do what you want them to do and to make them think it's their idea. But the big question we can ask ourselves right now is why don't people become rich in a country like ours with the opportunities we have? Why do so few people retire financially independent? And finally, I found the answers. These are what I consider to be the five reasons why people don't become rich. The first one at the top of the list is that it never occurs to them. The average person has grown up in a family where they have never known anyone rich. They go to school and socialize with people who are not rich. They work with people who are not rich. They have a reference group or a social circle outside of work that is not rich. They don't have role models who are rich. If this has happened to you throughout your formative years up to the age of 20, you can grow up and become a fully mature adult in our society. And it may never occur to you that it is as possible for you to become rich as for anyone else. This is why people who grow up in homes where their parents are rich are much more likely to become rich as adults than people who grew up in homes where their parents are not. So the first reason why people don't become rich is that it never occurs to them that it is possible for them. And of course, if it never occurs to them, they never take any of the necessary steps to make it happen, make a decision. The second reason why people don't become rich is that they never decide to do so. Even if a person reads a book, attends a conference, or associates with people who are financially successful, nothing changes until they make the decision to do something different. Even if a person realizes that they could become rich, if only they did certain things in a specific way, if they don't decide to take the first step, they end up staying where they are. If they continue to do what they've always done, they'll continue to get what they've always gotten. The main reason for underperformance and failure is that the vast majority of people don't decide to succeed. They never make a firm and unequivocal commitment or a definite decision that they are going to become rich. They want to and intend to and hope to and will someday. They wish, hope and pray to make a lot of money, but they never decide, I'm going to do it. This decision is an essential first step towards becoming financially independent, maybe tomorrow. The third reason why people don't become rich is procrastination. People always have a good reason for not starting to do what they know they need to do to achieve financial independence. It's always the wrong month, the wrong season, or the wrong year. Business conditions in their industry aren't good or maybe too good. The market isn't right. They might have to take risks or give up their security. Maybe next year. 
There always seems to be a reason to postpone things. As a result, they keep postponing month after month, year after year, until it's too late. Even if a person has realized that they can become rich and has made the decision to change, procrastination will push all their plans into an indefinite future. Pay the price. The fourth reason people retire poor is what economists call the inability to delay gratification. The vast majority of people have an irresistible temptation to spend every penny they earn and anything else they can borrow or buy on credit. If you can't delay gratification and discipline yourself to refrain from spending all you earn, you cannot become rich. If you can't practice budgeting as a lifelong habit, achieving financial independence will be impossible. As W. Clement Stone said, if you cannot save money, the seeds of greatness are not in you. Take the long view. The fifth reason people retire poor is perhaps as important, if not more important, than all the others, and it's lack of time perspective. In a longitudinal study conducted by Dr. Edward Bonfield at Harvard University in the 1950s and published in 1964 as The Unheavenly City, he studied the reasons for upward socioeconomic mobility. He wanted to know how one could predict whether an individual or a family would ascend in one or more socioeconomic groups and be wealthier in the next generations than in this generation. All his research led him to a single factor that he concluded was more accurate than any other in predicting success in the United States. They called it time perspective. This was defined as the amount of time taken into consideration when planning daily activities and making important decisions in life. Time perspective referred to how far into the future one projected when stating what they would or would not do in the present. An example of long-term perspective is the common practice among upper-class families in England of enrolling their children in Oxford or Cambridge as soon as they are born, even though they may not attend for 18 or 19 years. This is a long-term perspective in action. The young couple who starts saving $1.50 a month in a college fund for their newborn child to attend the college or university of their choice is a couple with long-term perspective. They are willing to sacrifice in the short term to ensure better outcomes and results in the long term. People with a long-term perspective almost invariably ascend economically throughout their lives. And as we come to the end of our journey together, I want to leave you with one final thought. The journey of overcoming limits and cultivating powerful habits is not a destination. It's a lifelong pursuit. It's about continuously challenging yourself, pushing past your comfort zone, and embracing growth and evolution at every turn. It's about recognizing that the only limits that truly exist are the ones we impose upon ourselves, and that with dedication, discipline, and unwavering belief in our potential, we have the power to transcend those limits and achieve greatness beyond our wildest dreams. So, as you step out into the world, armed with the knowledge and insights gained from our time together, I urge you to embrace the journey ahead with courage, conviction, and an unshakable commitment to excellence. Remember that every action you take, every habit you cultivate, has the power to shape your destiny and propel you towards the life you've always imagined. But perhaps most importantly, remember that you are not alone on this journey. Surround yourself with mentors, supporters, and fellow travelers who inspire and uplift you, and together you will soar to heights you never thought possible. Thank you for embarking on this journey with me. May you continue to push past your limits, defy expectations, and live a life filled with passion, purpose, and possibility. And may the powerful habits you've cultivated lead you beyond belief to a future filled with boundless opportunity and untold fulfillment. My belief is that about 80% of success or failure, maybe 90%, is caused by either clarity or lack of clarity. If successful people have one common characteristic, they're all very clear about who they are and what they want, and they have clear, written plans to achieve their goals in each key area of their life. Unsuccessful, unhappy people who are troubled by stress and anxiety are very unclear about who they are and what they want. And so therefore, they move from pillar to post. They're uh, not off-center very, very easily by unexpected events. So what we do in Focal Point is we start off with the principle of clarity, and we teach how to achieve clarity in the seven key areas of life. The first area is in business and career. 
in uh, family and personal relationships. What is you want and how you can get it in financial life? How do you achieve financial independence specifically? Health and fitness, how do you live to 80 or 90 years old? And then we talk about clarity with regard to personal and professional development goals, social and community contribution goals, and inner and spiritual development goals. So therefore, what a person gets is a complete approach to life with clarity in each of the seven areas. And then they all fold together so that they work in harmony with each other. Most successful people in our society work you know, four or five days a week. They took two or three days off. They take long vacations. They go home at night. They get vastly more done when they work than the average person. Whereas the average person feels overwhelmed with work. Too much to do. Too little time. Completely attacked on all sides by all kinds of conflicting responsibilities. And they can't understand why some people seem to be doing so much better than they are. People who are doing more nearly well. They're only five and ten times as much as other people in their field. And they take lots of vacations. They're relaxed. They're fit. They play golf and tennis. They go to Hawaii or the Caribbean. And you say, how can these people be doing so well and yet be working less than people who are blowing their brains up? And the answer is that they're focusing in on the few things that they can do that contribute the greatest value and they just simply outsource, delegate, eliminate everything else. And as a result, they have lots more time off in their personal life and they make much more when they work. I realize that all of life is the result of accumulation. And we call this the process of continuous improvement. So we found that if you get a little bit better every day, almost immeasurable, and a little bit better every week, and a little bit better every month, over time, like a snowball, it accumulates to a huge amount. And it worked out that if I could become one-tenth of one percent better per day, five days a week, I'd be half a percent better at the end of the week. If I did this for four weeks in a row, I'd be two percent better at the end of the month. If I did this for an entire year, I'd be 26% better. 52 weeks times half a percent is 26 better. If I did this, and it compounds, because I compound interest, if I did this for 2.7 years, I'd be twice productive. And if I did it for 2.7 years more, I'd be twice as productive again. If I did it for 10 years, I'd be 10 times more productive. Began to go to work, and we teach this in Crocom. Began to go to work on the most important things that I could get better at. And using my time better and be more focused and be more punctual and, and being, setting better priorities and learning more things. Would you know what happened? I increased my income by 10 times in about three and a half years. And in the next seven years, I increased my income by 10 times more. So that after 10 years, I was earning not, more, not just 10 times as much, but 100 times what I was earning when I started. And I've taught this to people all over the world. And they, and they come back to me and they say, after a few years, they said, that's incredible. After five years, I'm earning 10 times what I was earning. Next year, I'll be earning 12 times. And, and I need mean, your seven times, eight times, nine times. You get just a little bit better every day by design, not by chance. The cumulative effect in your life is extraordinary. And this explains the great success. All men and women start with nothing and achieve greater. Basic time management rule is the 80-20 rule, which says that 80% of your results will come from 20% of your actions, your work. So therefore, what we help people do right from the beginning is to say, what are the 20% of your activities that contribute 80% of the value of all your work? Let me give you an example. A businessman will say that 80% of my sales are coming from 20% of my customers. However, it also means that 80% of my expenses are coming from the 20% of my customers, or the 80% of my customers represent only 20% of my business. So what they do is they hire all the customers. Keep the top 20%, the ones where they make the most money, the ones who are the happiest, the ones who complain the least, the ones who pay their bills the most rapidly. And then they say, how can we get more customers like these ones in the top 20%? And suddenly their business doubles and triples, their profits go up, their costs go down, the amount of money and time spent servicing customers diminishes. Everything changes and changes sometimes in a matter of 30 days. Wow, the median satisfaction levels. Yes, of course. One of the things I tell people is only sell the people that you like and enjoy. Right? And get rid of anybody else that you don't like and enjoy. Encourage them to go and ruin your competitor's business. You know, and ruin your competitor's peace of mind. And people say, well, how can you do that? Well, when you start off in business, you're desperate, so you sell it to anybody who will buy. But as you get further along, you realize, hey, wait a minute, a lot of the customers that I'm servicing today are not really great customers. If I had a choice, I wouldn't have them. Good, you have a choice.
help them go somewhere else. Right. And use that same energy and concentrate on those customers that are worth five and ten times as much to you as the ones that complain and don't pay their bills. Last month, a woman came through her course. She went to her boss and she said, what do I have to do to double my income? He said, well, we have to restructure the work so that you did more and more of this and none of these other things. He said, well, if I do more and more of this and get these results, can you pay me twice as much? He said, you do it, I'll pay you twice as much. She couldn't believe it. She got double her income in one meeting. Because bosses remember today, if they're worth anything, pay on the basis of results, not hours. So if you can offer to contribute twice the results by working on the things that you do really well and getting rid of everything else, most bosses will pay on what the heck. And you make a list of everything you do. And let's say you do 10 or 15 things. And you ask yourself this question. If I could only do one thing on this list and do it really, really well, what one task or activity would make the greatest contribution to my work? And then you say, well, if I just did that more and more and none of the other things, I could earn twice as much, contribute twice as much as I'm contributing today. So you go to your boss and you say, boss, you know, I looked over this and I found if I could just do this all day long and do it really well, which I'm committed to do, I could contribute twice as much value. And your boss, who hasn't thought about it, will say, yes, that's true. If you did that all day long and did it really well, you say, well, can I get twice as much money? I say, sure, sure. You, if you do it, you see, many people think, well, I want you to pay me twice as much on the off chance that I will carry out my offer to you. No, what you do is you say, if I do this, will you pay me twice as much? I said, sure, it's nothing to lose because you're going to have to contribute vastly more to do it well. I will say, sure. I'm a boss. I own three companies. If somebody comes to me and says, look, I'll double the sales. I'll double the profitability. If you pay me twice as much, I say, absolutely. Yeah, 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 no problem. You don't lose proposition. No, right. That, that, great. You know, another concept you talk about that really got me thinking was this idea of zero-based thinking. And many people have heard that applied to looking at a business. Um, can you talk about it, though? Number one, what is zero-based thinking? And how do you apply it to your personal life? Really help to restructure. Well, I think that zero-based thinking is perhaps the finest thinking tool that a person can have for the rest of their life. And it's very simple. You look at any part of your world and you ask yourself, is there anything that I'm doing today that knowing what I now know, I wouldn't start up again today if I had to do it over again today? Well, it's a very simple question. And the way that you can tell if you have a zero-based thinking situation in your life is stress. Is wherever you experience chronic stress, that means stress that nags at you day in and day out. You say, with this person, situation, job, activity, knowing what I now know, would I start it again if I had to do it over? And if the answer is no, I wouldn't, then the next question is, how do you get out and how fast? Because there's a rule that things left to themselves get well from bad to worse. They don't just clear up. It's amazing how many people are sitting in a bad situation hoping that things would just clear up. They'll get better. Someone will come along and resolve the situation. It'll go away. So I say there's three key areas. Ask yourself, is there any relationship in your life, business or personal, that knowing what you now know, you wouldn't get into? Most of our stress in life comes from unhappy relationships that aren't working out. That's at work right home. And if there is, then the question is, how do you get out of this and how fast? Because there's a rule that we teach is that People don't change. People are what they are. They've always been that way. They'll never be any different. So don't hang all of your hopes for happiness on the off chance that somebody might change. Because they're not going to change. That's the way they are. The second area we say is with regard to your business. Is there any product or service? Is there any process or expense or advertising or anything that you're doing today that knowing what you now know, you wouldn't get injured? Let me give an example. One of our students, he was commissioned by his company to uh, find a way to improve the efficiency of their nationwide network of warehouses. And so he knew nothing about it, but he went in. His starting point was, should we have all these warehouses in the first place? And the way found, because of Federal Express, because of UPS, because of uh, flights and everything else, when the company started, they needed 12 warehouses to cover the country. However, he recommended that instead of improving the efficiency of the warehouses, they get rid of 10 of them, have one warehouse square in the middle of the west in Denver, one warehouse square in the middle of the east in, say, Memphis or Atlanta. It serves the whole country, get rid of all the others, and dramatically increase their efficiencies, which they did, and they saved $275 million. I'll keep asking, any part of your life, should we be in this area at all? And if not, how do we get out and how fast? 
Uh, you're also well known for acronyms, and uh, perhaps the best acronym that I found that described focal point was Grand Slam. The word slam is the key. It has four letters, S-L-A-M, which stands for simplify, leverage, accelerate, multiply. Now simplify means that you're constantly looking for ways to simplify your work and your personal life. We show that every additional step in any process dramatically increases the complexity of the process and the length of time it takes to do it. So we show people a whole new way of thinking in terms of simplification. And there's much more to it than that. The second is leverage. How do you leverage yourself? How do you leverage yourself times other people, times other people's knowledge, times other people's money, is other people's energy, times other people's skill, and so on. Because all successful people leverage themselves. They use themselves leveraged against other people to get vastly more done than the average person. The third letter, accelerate, means do it faster. We find that you can do a task slowly or quickly with the same level of quality. So we find that all successful people move fast. All unsuccessful people move slowly or when they get around to it. And the fourth letter is multiply. How do you multiply yourself? How do you delegate? How do you outsource? How do you eliminate? How do you downsize? How do you use every resource in your environment to multiply your ability? And these are the four keys, simplify, leverage, accelerate, and multiply, that enable people to go from rags to riches in one generation. We teach a complete process of time management that's a little bit different from other people, but it basically forces you to think through everything you have to do before you begin. Other than that, you'll have a tendency to react impulsively. If you react impulsively, you'll find yourself spending more and more time on items of less and less value. And pretty soon the day is gone and you haven't accomplished anything of importance. So therefore, the key to acceleration is to be very clear about what's most important and then do it quickly and do it now. In times of rapid change, you also have times of great turbulence, which means that all bets are off all the time. But one of my favorite lines is that uh, in this modern economy, you have to be willing to throw out all your assumptions every three weeks because things are changing so quickly. One new piece of information can totally change all of your thinking. One new competitive strategic step with a new product, a new service, a new advertisement, a slash price can totally change what you do in your business. So you can spend weeks and months coming to a conclusion, but some external event can force you to change quickly to survive. And that's why flexibility means you've got to be willing to constantly be open to the possibility that you're on the wrong track. With new information, you've got to be open to the possibility that there's a better way that you have to change. And people who are flexible are far more open, far more creative, they're far more optimistic than people who are inflexible and rigid in their thinking. So again, the Manager Institute has said that flexibility is the most important single quality for success in the 21st century. Some years ago, we started a program in San Diego called the Focal Point Advanced Coaching and Mentoring Program. And what the program is based upon is really four keys. The first is clarity. And we find that if people become extremely clear about what they want in each area of their life and crystallize it into goals or standards of performance and action steps, they begin to move ahead in an incredible race. The second part that we teach in the coaching program is what we call a simplification, which is to simplify your life so that you can take vastly more time off. As you know, we call this the double-double formula. Uh, you can double your income and double your time off at the same time. And it seems counterintuitive, as we talked about, because it's hard for people to think that by working less, I can earn more. But we do have people who come through our program, and we say that in a year to two years, you'll achieve this goal. Many of them achieve it in 30 days. Some people literally walk into the program and walk out and the next day literally transform their lives, simplify it dramatically, stop doing things that are of no value, just cut them off like a meat clear chunk, try to stop doing them, and then start focusing on getting better and better at the one or two things they do that pay them the most. And suddenly their incomes double and their time off increases dramatically. The relationships with their families improve, more time for health, vacations, travel, it's almost amazing. One of the things that people have to understand is that the whole purpose of working is to support your ideal lifestyle. So in the first part of the program, Clarity, we help people to define what is my ideal lifestyle? If my lifestyle were perfect, if I had millions of dollars in the bank, I could do anything I wanted to do, what would it look like? And then we bring it right down to reality and we say, what steps could we take today to begin creating that perfect lifestyle? 
It will show you how you can simplify. One of our principles is that the only way you can simplify your life is by stopping doing things. You can't do more things more efficiently and effectively. You have to stop things that are muddying up your life. The third principle we teach is what is called maximize. But how do you maximize your talents, abilities, skills, opportunities, so that you're getting the very, very most out of the energy that you put in? Remember, some people work eight hours a day and make $25,000. Another person working in the same company, out of the same office, working with the same customers, will make $250,000. And they're selling the same product to the same group at the same price under the same conditions. They're working at desks next to each other. One person makes 10 times as much as the others. Why? That's what we explain. Let me show you how to do it. And the final part is what I call leverage. How do you leverage yourself? How do you get the very most of every part of your life? And the, the coaching process is, is really interesting because people, first of all, do pre-work. In other words, they ask, answer a series of questions so they come fully prepared and then they do eight hours of work with me and other very successful people. And they come out of it with an action blueprint, which they then follow for the next three months. Then they come back after three months and do it again. What happens is that within one year, people's lives transform. Sometimes, as I say, within 30 days, sometimes in 24 hours. <laughs> because for the first time, it's like somebody ran inside their brain and turned on all the lights of their possibilities. Suddenly, they can see themselves in their life better than ever before. One of my favorite stories, which is in the program, is, uh, is a gentleman, or an old friend of mine, working his heart out 12, 14 hours a day, six, seven days a week, and never spent any time with his family, hadn't taken a vacation in four years. He came through the focal point process, his arms were folded, very skeptical that it's possible to work less and, and make more money. But he realized that it was true, and so he did what all superior people do, is he acted upon the information. Most people will hear what we talk about not act on. But the very best people will take it and run with it, like a football player catching a fumble and running for yards. But he went back and he analyzed his clients. He realized that he, it was not 80-20, it was 90-10. About 90% of his business was coming from 10% of his clients. So he decided to just draw a line at the 20% mark, took his bottom 80% of clients and began to parcel them out like dealing cards to other small companies that could service them better. He began then to really focus on his top clients and to really work them, excuse the word, for referrals. Who else do you know in your level would be interested in working with me and my company? And you know what? They said, I'm glad you asked because I've been willing to tell you for years, you just never asked. So he began getting referrals, like a frog jumping from lily pad to lily pad. He began getting referrals from top people to top people to top people. In less than six months, he tripled his income. He increased his time off to one week per month. He started taking vacations with his family. He started exercising again. He just lost 22 pounds. He literally transformed his life and his income went up by three times. There is a single secret of success and it is this. Do what you resolve to do. Do what you have decided to do. Fulfill your promises to yourself. If you say you're going to get up early in the morning and exercise, just do what you said you would do. If you say you're going to save, then save your money. If you say you're going to write down your goals, do it. If you're going to listen to audio programs in your car, just darn well do what you resolve to do. Complete, fulfill your commitments to yourself and your whole life will be wonderful. Use of time is to uh, work intently on something that need not be done at all. And one of the things that is holding back entrepreneurs, business owners, it's killing them, by the way, and it's wiping out an entire generation, is this obsession with technology. I, I see people who are walking with their phone. It's almost like drug addicts, they're mainline. The fact is that this obsession with looking at the screen and staying connected, killing people. Because it, it stops them from focusing. Warren Buffett was at a dinner party, Bill Gates, and Bill Gates Sr. And they were talking to Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. And Bill Gates' father, very, very successful. And somebody came. That's down and excuse me for interrupting you, but we've just been noticing. Okay. What would you say is the most And all three, turn to him, said the same word. Focus. Focus. And that's why so concerned about the attraction. Yeah, yeah. So disturbing because it guarantees failure.
You actually become addicted to distraction. If you have, you don't have addicted. And if you can't focus, you have dancing. And so distraction, technological distraction, that is so the way your hopes for your future is keeping you busy and at the end of the day you've accomplished and you're exhausted and rethought of it, how much to And yeah, it's just about eighty percent. And the rest of the time, by the end of the day you're sleeping a while. Do the really important thing. Or your recent required. At the end of the day, typical day today, average person IQ has increased. That means throughout a distracting day, you get stupider all day long. And by the end of the day, you're just done with simulating your so much. What happens, every stimulus triggers dopamine, and dopamine has, it has the same effect as cocaine in your brain. It's a stimulus. You cannot not watch it. I mean, many people get up in the middle of the night to see if there's any email, any staff. And then they go back to bed. They say, ask, I ask my business, the purpose, no. If that's what your business is, then do you spend all of your time? You know what the average business owner today spends? Only 11% of them. All the rest is. And they don't even realize until somebody follows them around. I'll give you a very simple way to double your income. Here it is. So when you start in the morning, meet that computer while you're in that is don't Rule for success today is leave green. So if you're the reason you're in business, you generate sales, and all you do for the 90 minutes is that you do revenue generate value creation. Then you take a 15 minute break, and then you start again and do another 90 minutes. All you do is value creation. That's the reason why you're working this in your shop to that. do anything but that. Now, we don't turn on our that. People will go crazy because taking dope. People who are addicted go into convulsions. And they will go into convulsions. But you'll have to do it yourself. You have to go through your own convulsions. We live in a world where focus is more valuable than even your intelligence. The addiction to distraction will be the death of your creative production. I mean, if you watch most performers today, you watch most people in business today. You watch most people in your community today. They are addicted to the entertainment of video games. They are spending the best hours of their days watching dancing cats. They are wasting their human potential hooked into some social platform that is creating empires for other people. They're not living their human potential. They're not living their economic potential because they're hooked to a screen. It is the most frightening time in the history of the world and it's the most gorgeous time in the history of humanity. Most people are lost. Most people are hooked. If you want to achieve the results only 5% achieve, you've got to think and produce and behave like only 5% of the people on the planet. And the best people on the planet in terms of creativity and productivity are not spending their finest hours addicted to distraction. They're doing real work. And so I want to walk you through a number of protocols that will really help you multiply your productivity in the finest of work. For the next 90 days, spend the first 90 minutes of your workday on your single most game-changing opportunity. And research has shown that the morning hours are when you have the most focus, when you have the most energy, when you have the most willpower. And so you want to use that first 90 minutes. Second piece of technology to create exponential productivity is what I call tight bubbles of total focus. Your environment is so important. And if you look in B performers or C producers, they really don't pay a lot of attention to their environment. And so they get very distracted. There's lots of noises. Phones are going off. Maybe there's news in the background. Maybe there's me messy environments all around them. Maybe there's toxic people. The way I run my work life on certain days, I am very hard to read. I mean, I see a lot of people not judging them, it's just observing them. Every time their phone rings, they check. Or they have, you know, these loud notifications. 
They're constantly being distracted. If you are being distracted by notifications, checking your phone, checking your Twitter feed, checking your Facebook feed, looking on Instagram, checking all the different platforms, that is going to destroy your focus. I do it is I have certain days I label as creative days. And on those creative days, I actually go device free. And on those days, I go to certain places, call them my Menlo lab, and that's where I do my best work. So install where you will do your best work and get your best. The next piece of technology that will help you create exponential productivity in your work life is choose your peer group really, really well. If you want to be a high performer in terms of your productivity, populate your life with high performers. Now here we are in the modern world and what happens? Subconsciously, we are modeling the behavior people we spend most of our time with. If you are around people who are mediocre performers, you will subconsciously start behaving like them. Why else is it important to surround yourself with a peer set or a social orbit? A players emotional contagion. You're around a social circle of people who are inspired, people who want to do great work, people who want to be ultra productive, people who want to be innovative, people who are relentlessly optimizing their work, their thinking, their creativity. Just being around them will allow you to adopt their energy and their ways of being. And then the final technology for you to create exponential productivity is what I call learn minimalism. Now, I've worked with a lot of the most creative and productive people on the planet. If you look at the greatest empire builders economically, Musk, Steve Jobs, great example. You know, he lived in a pretty simple house, even when he was a multi-billion. He was only about a few things, my favorite things in life. Books and sea. If you look at a great artist, they didn't fill their work days and their personal lives with a lot of things. They filled them with a few things. If you look at any great artist, any great entrepreneur, any great build, business builder, any great author, any great humanitarian, they were monomaniacally focused on one thing. They were minimalists. So what I want to leave you with this. Maybe this year, rather than having 50 projects that you want to achieve at the highest level, maybe pick three. This year, rather than trying to read 20 audiobooks, 50 ebooks, go to five courses. I am encouraging you to really adopt this thinking protocol of becoming a minimalist. Even your home, fill it with just a few things. Even your work life, few projects. Even your clients, the highest leverage client. Not to identify your target. Nothing stand in your way. If you don't keep your mind on what you're doing, you don't keep bulk ask it and could right on by whatever you're supposed to be doing for the moment do it can't be thinking of everything that at one time all the time you have to concentrate on just one thing at a time one project one job you know won't accomplish it's a lot of just not that phone every time it rings at home concentrate on the work at the end of your discipline. If you have a long list done within a day, do the toughest ones while you're constant. That it's don't let your mind one day focus. You never know what important points you. When you recognize the need to constant more, when you recognize the need, when you discipline yourself to stay focused, it will come easier and easier. Focus concentration can be learned. Focus, concentration, on the habit. Work on it a little every day, and yourself to be where you are. Work and work, play at play. Wherever you are, be there, constant. My belief is that about 80% of success or failure, maybe 90%, is caused by either clarity or lack of clarity. His successful people have one common characteristic. They're all very clear about who they are and what they want. And they have clear written plans to achieve their goals in each key area of their life. Unsuccessful, unhappy people who are troubled by stress and anxiety are very unclear about who they are and what they want. And so therefore they move from pillar to post. They're uh, not off center very, very easily by unexpected events. 
So what we do in focal point is we start off with the principle of clarity and we teach how to achieve clarity in the seven key areas of life. The first area is in business and career, in uh, family and personal relationships, what is you want and how you can get it in financial life, how do you achieve financial independence specifically, health and fitness, how you live to 80 or 90 years old, and then we talk about clarity with regard to personal and professional development goals, social and community contribution goals, and inner and spiritual development goals. So therefore, what a person gets is a complete approach to life with clarity in each of the seven areas, and then they all fold together so that they work in harmony with each other. Most successful people in our society work you know, four or five days a week. They take two or three days off. They take long vacations. They go home at night. They get vastly more done when they work than the average person, whereas the average person feels overwhelmed with work, too much to do, too little time, completely attacked on all sides by all kinds of conflicting responsibilities. And they can't understand why some people seem to be doing so much better than they are. People who are doing work nearly well. They're only five and ten times as much as other people in their field. And they take lots of vacations. They're relaxed. They're fit. They play golf and tennis. They go to Hawaii or the Caribbean. And you say, how can these people be doing so well and yet be working less than people who are blowing their brains up? And the answer is that they're focusing in on the few things that they can do that contribute the greatest value and they just simply outsource, delegate, eliminate everything else. And as a result, they have lots more time off in their personal life, and they make much more when they work. I realize that all of life is the result of accumulation. And we call this the process of continuous improvement. So we found that if you get a little bit better every day, almost immeasurable, and a little bit better every week, and a little bit better every month, over time, like a snowball, it accumulates to a huge amount. And it worked out that if I could become one-tenth of one percent better per day, five days a week, I'd be half a percent better at the end of the week. If I did this for four weeks in a row, I'd be two percent better at the end of the month. If I did this for an entire year, I'd be twenty-six percent better. Fifty-two weeks times half a percent is twenty-six percent better. If I did this, and it compounds, because I compound interest, if I did this for 2.7 years, I'd be twice productive. And if I did it for 2.7 years more, I'd be twice as productive again. If I did it for 10 years, I'd be 10 times more productive. Began to go to work, and we teach this in focal part. Began to go to work on the most important things that I could get better at. And using my time better, and being more focused, and being more punctual, and, and being, setting better priorities, and learning more things. Well, you know what happened? I increased my income by 10 times in about three and a half years. And in the next seven years, I increased my income by 10 times more. So that after 10 years, I was earning time work, not just 10 times as much, but 100 times what I was earning when I started. And I've taught this to people all over the world. And they, and they come back to me and they say, after a few years, they said, that's incredible. After five years, I'm earning 10 times what I was earning. Next year, I'll be earning 12 times. And, and they, I know mean, you're seven times, eight times, nine times. If you get just a little bit better every day by design, not by chance, the cumulative effect in your life is extraordinary. And this explains the great success of all men and women who start with nothing and achieve greater. Basic time management rule is the 80-20 rule, which says that 80% of your results will come from 20% of your actions, your work. So therefore, what we help people do right from the beginning is to say, what are the 20% of your activities? that contribute 80% of the value of all your work. Let me give you an example. A businessman will say that 80% of my sales are coming from 20% of my customers. However, it also means that 80% of my expenses are coming from the 20% of my customers, or the 80% of my customers represent only 20% of my business. So what they do is they fire all the customers. Keep the top 20%, the ones who make the most money, the ones who are the happiest, the ones who complain the least, the ones who pay their bills the most rapidly. And then they say, how can we get more customers like these ones in the top 20%? And suddenly their business doubles and triples, their profits go up, their costs go down, the amount of money and time spent servicing customers diminishes, everything changes and changes sometimes in a matter of 30 days. Wow, the million satisfaction levels. Yes, but of course, one of the things I tell people is only sell the people that you like and enjoy. Right. And get rid of anybody else that you don't like and enjoy. Encourage them to go and ruin your competitors' businesses. Because they all and ruin your competitors' peace of mind. And people say, well, how can you do that? Well, when you start off in business, you're desperate, so you sell it so anybody will buy. But as you get 
further along you realize, hey, wait a minute, a lot of the customers that I'm servicing today are not really great customers. If I had a choice, I wouldn't have them. Good, you have a choice. Help them go somewhere else. Right. And use that same energy and concentrate on those customers that are worth five and ten times as much to you as the ones that complain and don't pay the bills. Last month, a woman came through her course. She went to her boss and she said, what do I have to do to double my income? He said, well, we have to restructure the work so that you did more and more of this and none of these other things. He said, well, if I do more and more of this and get these results, can you pay me twice as much? He said, you do it, I'll pay you twice as much. She couldn't believe it. She got double her income in one meeting. Because bosses remember today, if they're worth anything, pay on the basis of results, not hours. So if you can offer to contribute twice the results by working on the things that you do really well and getting rid of everything else, most bosses will pay on what the heck. Then you make a list of everything you do. And let's say you do 10 or 15 things. And you ask yourself this question. If I could only do one thing on this list and do it really, really well, what one task or activity would make the greatest contribution to my work? And then you say, well, if I just did that more and more and none of the other things, I could earn twice as much, contribute twice as much as I'm contributing today. So you go to your boss and you say, boss, you know, I've looked over this and I found if I could just do this all day long and do it really well, which I'm committed to do, I could contribute twice as much value. And your boss, who hasn't thought about it, will say, yes, that's true. If you did that all day long and did it really well, you say, well, could I get twice as much money? I say, sure, sure. And you, if you do it, you see many people think, well, I want you to pay me twice as much on the off chance that I will carry out my um, offer to you. No. What you do is you say, if I do this, will you pay me twice as much? I say, sure, there's nothing to lose because you're going to have to contribute vastly more to do it well. I will say, sure. I'm a boss. I own three companies. If somebody comes to me and says, I'll double the sales. I'll double the profitability. If you pay me twice as much, I say, absolutely, yeah, 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 no problem. No lose proposition, no, right? Yeah, yeah, great. You know, another concept he talked about that really uh, got me thinking was this idea of zero-based thinking. And many people have heard that applied to looking at a business. Um, can you talk about it, though? Number one, what is zero-based thinking and how do you apply it to your personal life? Really help to restructure and well, I think that zero-based thinking is perhaps the finest thinking tool that a person can have for the rest of their life. And it's very simple. You look at any part of your world and you ask yourself, is there anything that I'm doing today that knowing what I now know, I wouldn't start up again today if I had to do it over again today? Well, it's a very simple question. And the way that you can tell if you have a zero-based thinking situation in your life is stress. It's wherever you experience chronic stress. I mean, stress that nags at you day in and day out. You say, with this person, situation, job, activity, knowing what I now know, would I start it again if I had to do it over? And if the answer is no, I wouldn't, then the next question is, how do you get out and how fast? Because th there's a rule that things left to themselves get go from bad to worse. They don't just clear up. It's amazing how many people are sitting in a bad situation hoping that things will just clear up. Mm -hmm. They'll get better. Someone will come along and resolve the situation. It'll go away. So I say there's three key areas. Ask yourself, is there any relationship in your life, business or personal, that knowing what you now know, you wouldn't get into? Most of our stress in life comes from unhappy relationships that aren't working out. That's at work right home. And if there is, then the question is, how do you get out of this and how fast? Because there's a rule that we teach is that People don't change. People are what they are. They've always been that way. They'll never be any different. So don't hang all of your hopes for happiness on the off chance that somebody might change. Because they're not going to change. That's the way they are. The second area we say is with regard to your business. Is there any product or service? Is there any process or expense or advertising or anything that you're doing today that knowing what you now know, you wouldn't get injured? Let me give an example of one of our students. He was commissioned by his company to uh, find a way to improve the efficiency of their nationwide network of warehouses. Mm -hmm. And so he knew nothing about it, but he went in. His starting point was, should we have all these warehouses in the first place? And the way he found, because of Federal Express, because of UPS, because of flights and everything else, when the company started, they needed 12 warehouses to cover the country. However, he recommended that instead of improving the efficiency of the warehouses, they get rid of 10 of them, have one warehouse square in the middle of the west in Denver, one warehouse square in the middle of the east in, say, Memphis or Atlanta, that service the whole country, get rid of all the others, and dramatically increase their efficiencies. 
which they did, and they saved $275 million. Now, keep asking, in any part of your life, should we be in this area at all? And if not, how do we get out and how that? Uh, you're also well known for acronyms, and uh, perhaps the best acronym that I found that described focal point was the Grand Slam. Method. The word slam is the key. It has four letters, S-L-A-M, which stands for simplify, leverage, accelerate, multiply. Now simplify means that you're constantly looking for ways to simplify your work and your personal life. We show that every additional step in any process dramatically increases the complexity of the process and the length of time it takes to do it. So we show people a whole new way of thinking in terms of simplification. And there's much more to it than that. The second is leverage. How do you leverage yourself? How do you leverage yourself times other people, times other people's knowledge, times other people's money, times other people's energy, times other people's skill, and so on. Because all successful people leverage themselves. They use themselves leverage against other people to get vastly more done than the average person. The third letter, accelerate, means do it faster. We find that you can do a task slowly or quickly with the same level of quality. So we find that all successful people move fast. All unsuccessful people move slowlier when they get around to it. And the fourth letter is multiple. How do you multiply yourself? How do you delegate? How do you outsource? How do you eliminate? How do you downsize? How do you use every resource in your environment to multiply your ability? And these are the four keys, simplify, leverage, accelerate, and multiply, that enable people to go from rags to riches in one generation. We teach a complete process of time management that's a little bit different from other people, but it basically forces you to think through everything you have to do before you begin. Other than that, you'll have a tendency to react impulsively. And if you react impulsively, you'll find yourself spending more and more time on items of less and less value. And pretty soon the day is gone and you haven't accomplished anything of importance. So therefore, the key to acceleration is to be very clear about what's most important and then do it quickly and do it now. In times of rapid change, you also have times of great turbulence, which means that all bets are off all the time. But one of my favorite lines is that uh, in this modern economy, you have to be willing to throw out all your assumptions every three weeks because things are changing so quickly. One new piece of information can totally change all of your thinking. One new competitive strategic step with a new product, a new service, a new advertisement, a slash price can totally change what you do in your business. So you can spend weeks and months coming to a conclusion, but some external event can force you to change quickly to survive. And that's why flexibility means you've got to be willing to constantly be open to the possibility that you're on the wrong track. With new information, you've got to be open to the possibility that there's a better way, that you have to change. And people who are flexible are far more open, far more creative, they're far more optimistic, and people who are inflexible and rigid in their thinking. So, again, the Manager Institute has said that flexibility is the most important single quality for success in the 21st century. Some years ago, we started a program in San Diego called the Focal Point Advanced Coaching and Mentoring Program. And what the program is based upon is really four keys. The first is clarity. And we find that if people become extremely clear about what they want in each area of their life and crystallize it into goals with standards of performance and action steps, they begin to move ahead in an incredible race. The second part that we teach in the coaching program is what we call a simplification, which is to simplify your life so that you can take vastly more time off. As you know, we call this the double-double formula. How you can double your income and double your time off at the same time. And it seems counterintuitive, as we talked about, because it's hard for people to think that by working less, I can earn more. But we do have people who come through our program, and we say that in a year to two years, you'll achieve this goal. Many of them achieve it in 30 days. Some people literally walk into the program and walk out and the next day literally transform their lives, simplify it dramatically, stop doing things that are of no value, just cut them off like a meat clear, just stop doing them, and then start focusing on getting better and better at the one or two things they do that pay them the most. As suddenly their incomes double and their time off increases dramatically. The relationships with their families improve, more time for health, vacations, travel, it's almost amazing. One of the things that people have to understand is that the whole purpose of working is to support your ideal lifestyle. So in the first part of the program, Clarity, we help people to define what is my ideal lifestyle. If my lifestyle were perfect, if I had millions of dollars in the bank, I could do anything I wanted to do. 
what would it look like? And then we bring it right down to reality and we say, what steps could we take today to begin creating that perfect lifestyle? And we'll show you how you can simplify. One of our principles is that the only way you can simplify your life is by stopping doing things. You can't do more things more efficiently and effectively. You have to stop things that are muddying up your life. The third principle we teach is what is called maximize. Well, how do you maximize your talents, abilities, skills, opportunities so that you're getting the very, very most out of the energy that you put in? Remember, some people work eight hours a day and make $25,000. Another person working in the same company, out of the same office, working with the same customers, will make $250,000. And they're selling the same product to the same people at the same price under the same conditions. They're working at desks next to each other. One person makes 10 times as much as the others. Why? That's what we explain. And we show you how to do it. And the final part is what I call leverage. How do you leverage yourself? How do you get the very most out of every part of your life? And the, the coaching process is, is really interesting because people, first of all, do pre-work. In other words, they ask, answer a series of questions so they come fully prepared and then they do eight hours of work with me and other very successful people, and they come out of it with an action blueprint, which they then follow for the next three months. Then they come back after three months and do it again. What happens is that in one year, people's lives transform. Sometimes, as I say, within 30 days, sometimes in 24 hours, <laughs> because for the first time, it's like somebody ran inside their brain and turned on all the lights of their possibilities. Suddenly, they can see themselves in their life better than ever before. So one of my favorite stories, which is in the program, is uh, as a gentleman, an old friend of mine, working his heart out 12, 14 hours a day, six, seven days a week, and never spent any time with his family. Hadn't taken a vacation in four years. He came through the focal point process. His arms were folded, very skeptical that it's possible to work less and, and make more money. But he realized that it was true, and so he did what all superior people do, is he acted on the information. Most people will hear what we talk about and not act on. But the very best people will take it and run with it, like a football player catching a fumble and running for yards. Well, he went back and he analyzed his clients. He realized that it was not 80-20, it was 90-10. About 90% of his business was coming from 10% of his clients. So he decided to just draw a line at the 20% mark, took his bottom 80% of clients and began to parcel them out by dealing cards to other small companies that could service them better. He began then to really focus on his top clients and to really work them, excuse the word, for referrals. Who else do you know in your level would be interested in working with me and my company? And you know what? They said, I'm glad you asked because I've been willing to tell you for years. You just never asked. So he began getting referrals like a frog jumping from lily pad to lily pad. He began getting referrals from top people to top people to top people. In less than six months, he tripled his income. He increased his time off to one week per month. He started taking vacations with his family. He started exercising again. He just lost 22 pounds. He literally transformed his life and his income went up by three times. There is a single secret of success and it is this. Do what you resolve to do. Do what you have decided to do. Fulfill your promises to yourself. If you say you're going to get up early in the morning and exercise, just do what you said you would do. If you say you're going to save, then save your money. If you say you're going to write down your goals, do it. If you're going to listen to audio programs in your car, just darn well do what you resolve to do. Complete, fulfill your commitments to yourself and your whole life will be wonderful. Very worst use of time is to uh, work intently on something that need not be done at all. And one of the things that is holding back entrepreneurs, business owners, is killing them, by the way, and it's wiping out an entire generation it's this obsession with technology. I, I see people that are walking with their phone. It's almost like drug addicts, they're mainline. The fact is that this obsession with looking at the screen and staying connected is killing people because it, it stops them from focusing. Warren Buffett was at a dinner party, Bill Gates and Bill Gates Sr. And they were talking together because Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are good friends. And Bill Gates' father, very, very successful, and somebody came asked down and excuse me for interrupting you, but we've just been noticing talking. I've got a question. What would you say is the most important? And all three turned to him, said the same words. Focus. Focus. 
That's why I'm so concerned about the for the attraction distract. It is so disturbing because it guarantees failure. You actually become addicted to distraction. If you have, if you are addicted to and if you can't focus at dancing. And so distraction, technological distraction, okay, is destroying your hopes for your future, it's keeping you busy, and at the end of the day you become and you're exhausted. You really thought about how much time. And the action is about eighty percent. And the rest of the time, by the end of the day, you're too do anything like what? Is a really important thing. When you reach it why? The end of the day, of a typical day today, average per IQ has decreased. That means throughout a distracting day, you get stupider all day long. And by the end of the day, you're just jumping, simulating your so much. What happens? Every stimulus triggers dopamine, and dopamine has, it has the same effect as cocaine on your brain. It's a stimulus. You cannot not watch your computer. I mean, many people get up in the middle of the night to see if there's any email. Did he stay? And then they go back to bed. They say, you ask, I ask my business. You and this. You know, if that's what your business is, then do you spend all of your time? You know what the average business owner today is? Only 11% of their time. All the rest. Is, and they don't even realize it until somebody follows them around with it. So I'll give you a very simple way to double your income. Here it is. So when you start in the morning, be think check your computer or your never don't rule for success today is we think so if you're the reason you're in business to generate sales avenues all you do for the ninety minutes it's well to do revenue generation value creation then you take a fifteen minute break and then you start again and do another ninety minutes. All you do is now you create. So that's the reason why you're working this on yourself to do that. Do anything but that. Three hours. We don't turn on our computer. Oh no. But you do that. People will go crazy because it's like taking double. People who are addicted, they go into convulsions. And they will go into convulsions. But you'll have to do it yourself. You have to go through your own convulsions. You'll have we live in a world where focus is more valuable than even your intelligence. An addiction to distraction will be the death of your creative production. If you watch most performers today, you watch most people in business today, you watch most people in your community today, they are addicted to the entertainment of video games. They are spending the best hours of their days watching dancing cats. They are wasting their human potential hooked into some social platform that is creating empires for other people. They're not living their human potential, they're not living their economic potential because they're hooked to a screen. It is the most frightening time in the history of the world and it's the most gorgeous time in the history of humanity. Most people are lost, most people are hooked. If you want to achieve the results only 5% achieve, you've got to think and produce and behave like only 5% of the people on the planet. And the best people on the planet in terms of creativity and productivity are not spending their finest hours addicted to distraction. They're doing real work. And so then I want to walk you through a number of protocols that will really help you multiply your productivity in the finest of life for the next 90 days. Then the first 90 minutes of your workday on your single most game-changing opportunities. And research has shown that the morning hours are when you have the most focus, when you have the most energy, and when you have the most willpower. And so you want to use that first 90 minutes. The second piece of technology to create exponential productivity is what I call tight bubbles of total focus. Your environment is so important. If you look at B performers or C producers, they really don't pay a lot of attention to their environment. And so they get very distracted. There's lots of noises. Phones are going off. Maybe there's news in the background. Maybe there's me messy environments all around them. Maybe there's toxic people. The way I run my work life on certain days, I am very hard to read. I mean, I see a lot of people. 
not judging them, it's just observing them. Every time their phone rings, they check it. Or they have, you know, these loud notifications. So they're constantly being distracted. If you are being distracted by notifications, checking your phone, checking your Twitter feed, checking your Facebook feed, looking on Instagram, checking all the different platforms, that is going to destroy your focus. I do it is I have certain days I label as creative days. And on those creative days, I actually go device free. On those days, I go to certain places, call them my Menlo lab, and that's where I do my best work. So install where you will do your best work and get your best. The next piece of technology that will help you create exponential productivity in your work life is choose your peer group really, really well. If you want to be a high performer in terms of your productivity, populate your life with high performers. Now here we are in the modern world, and what happens? Subconsciously, we are modeling the behavior of people we spend most of our time with. You're down around people who are mediocre performers. You will subconsciously start behaving like them. Why else is it important to surround yourself with a peer set or a social orbit of A players? Emotional contagion. You are around a social circle of people who are inspired, people who want to do great work, people who want to be ultra productive, people who want to be innovative, people who are relentlessly optimizing their work, their thinking, their creativity. Just being around them will allow you to adopt their energy and their ways of being. And then the final technology for you to create exponential productivity is what I call learned minimalism. Now, I've worked with a lot of the most creative and productive people on the planet. If you look at the greatest empire builders economically, Musk, Steve Jobs, great example. You know, he lived in a pretty simple house, even when he was a multi-billion. He was only about a few things, my favorite things in life. Books and see. If you look at a great artist, he didn't fill their work days and their personal lives with a lot of things. They filled them with a few things. If you look at any great artist, any great entrepreneur, any great build, business builder, any great author, any great humanitarian, they were monomaniacally focused on one thing. They were minimalists. And so what I want to leave you with is this. Maybe this year, rather than having 50 projects that you want to achieve at the highest level, maybe pick three. This year, rather than trying to read 20 audiobooks, 50 ebooks, go to five courses. I am encouraging you to really adopt this thinking protocol of becoming a minimalist. Even your home, fill it with just a few things. Even your work life, few projects. Even your clients, just the highest leverage clients. Not to identify your target. Nothing stand in your way. If you don't keep your mind on what you're doing, you don't get bogus. Ask it again. Good stuff. Right on by. Whatever you're supposed to be doing for the moment, do it. Can't be thinking of everything you have to do at one time. All the time. Have to concentrate on just one thing at a time. One crutch. One job. You don't. Won't accomplish it. It's a lot of discipline not to answer the phone every time it rings at home. Concentrate on the work at and demand of you the discipline. Stay fine. If you have a long list of things to get done within a day, do the toughest ones while your concentration is at its. Don't let your mind one day focus. You never know what important points you When you recognize the need to concentrate more, when you recognize the need, when you discipline yourself to focus, it will come easier and easier. Focus concentration can be learned. Focus, concentration, become a habit. Work on it a little every day. Put yourself to be where you are. Work at work and play at play. Wherever you are, be there. Constant. We talked about this in time management. Key to building your ambition, being on track with all of the principles, is focus, constant. Got to identify your target. Let nothing stand in your way. Let nothing capture your attention. Unless it's in the best of your ambition, let not an obstacle before you without getting around it, going over, going under, trying a different path and get. You have to have just one thing in mind, being on track.
closing out all the noise and clutter in your way, going around all the obstacles, negative influence. And what if you lose your concentration? Game's over. In a major presentation, just lose your concentration for a flash of a second. I'm telling you, you could lose it all. All the hard work, all the long hours, all the preparation, all the momentum building to that crucial. Have to concentrate on just one thing at a time. One project, one job. You have to take it one task at a time. Complete. Here's number two. Resilience. Resilience. Being able to withstand setbacks. Broken hearts. Broken dreams. Financial crisis. Loss of love. Loss of enterprise. Loss of self. How would you ever handle it? Lost everything you had. Well, number one, it would take a lot of self-discipline. It would take a lot of concentration to block out the noise and clutter of all the negative voices trying to get through your negative voices, the negative voices of others around you. It would take a lot of discipline, balance, fear and anxiety, the knowing that yet at once you do it all over again, what's happened has happened. You would need to get on with your life and get again. It would take a lot of faith, trust in God to move ahead. We lost everything tomorrow and we're gathering all the courage to try again. It would take a lot of self-appreciation. Knowing that you have the skills, and the talent, the strengths to do it one more time. You have to approach the situation rationally and figure out how to bounce back your lot. You have to evaluate and then start a plan to recapture the lost man. Increase your market share with other businesses. Network with associates. Bring in a similar client or a larger one. Now maybe your loss is a personal one. Death of a loved one. Divorce. Loss of a very special friend. If your loss is a personal one, you must approach the situation a little differently. Cultivating a resilient character turns what others would call failure to his death. A resilient person won't give up. A resilient person will, in spite of all us, to set back doing it until to build a resilient character you must have number one insight. The ability to ask and be honest with your answer. If you had something to do with your loss, be honest. Possible. Number two, resilience is independent. Resilient person counts only on themselves to bust back in. Number three, although resilience is independent, it's also tied to others. The more people you are responsible to, the greater the motivation to begin again. The stronger the reason, the stronger the action. Fourth component of resilience is initiative. Ability to take charge of the ability to take charge of the problem. Ability to stand up and do whatever is necessary. Back up. Number five, being able to look at the situation and creatively determine the best way out. But for solution, the enterprising your approach towards starting over. Number six, sense of humor. You've got to take your ambition seriously. And you've got to take yourself seriously. You've also got to be able to laugh yourself sometimes. Situation. Mess. Here's the last. Morality. Whatever you do to get back on. Whatever you do to bounce back. I make sure that your upcoming success is at the service of others, not at the expense of others. Number one cornerstone for an ambitious life is concentration. Number two, resilience. And here's number three. Integrity. Without integrity, ambition loses its unifying focus. It comes from integrated goals, from really knowing what you want. It all shop for the greatest value at the best price, not at the expense of others. Not when your great deal cheated someone out of their profit. Pay an honest price, not a thousand. Make it good for everybody involved. Don't be cheap. Be fair. If I want something Badly enough, I have to burn it. If I want something badly enough, I have to give it.
And if I wish to have more, I must earn more. I must earn more. Be like the grows as high as it can. Be like the bird that soars as high as it can. Be like the flowers that bloom as much as yes. Part of integrity. Honest, doing all you can in pursuit of what you want, pursuit of what you'll become. The most important thing you do for your success is to take control of the suggestive elements in your environment. Be sure that what you are seeing and listening to is consistent with the goals that you want to achieve. Listen to educational audio programs in your car. The average person drives 12,000 to 25,000 miles per year, which works out to between 500 and 1,000 hours per year that the average person spends in his or her car. You can become an expert in your field by simply listening to educational audio programs as you drive from place to place. Attend seminars given by experts in your field, take additional courses and learn everything you possibly can learn from the experts. Ask them questions, write them letters, read their books, read their articles, and listen to people with proven track records in the area in which you want to be successful. It can save you years of work and thousands and thousands of dollars. Have a vision for yourself and a vision for your life. The key to having a vision is to have a dream. They say in the song, you've got to have a dream if you want to make a dream come true. Then you can fulfill your dreams. All the great movers and shakers of all of history have been dreamers. They've been people with dreams, they've been people with visions. All leaders have vision. In the book of Solomon it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And the metaphysical meaning of that is that where people lack vision, they perish inside because they lose the excitement and the thrill of life. And what most people do, because of negative experiences, because of fear of failure and so on, is they, if they have a vision at all, they tone it down so it's so small and so so safe that it doesn't turn them on, it doesn't excite them, and they wonder why life isn't exciting. A beautiful line I read not long ago said, the best way to predict the future is to create it, which means to have a vision. And even though the vision is in the air or the sky, then build a foundation under your dreams. And when you see men and women who rise from poverty and obscurity to fame and renown, you invariably see someone who had a vision of what they could be and have and do that was far beyond what they were. Every one of us has had an experience at one time when we were small. We had a vision of growing up and having our own cars. And as we grew older, we had a vision of having our own homes and our own families. As we grew older, we had a vision of traveling and going to Europe. Wow. We fulfill all our visions. The wonderful thing is this, is that we always tend to achieve our goals. The problem is that our goals are set so low that even when we do achieve them, they don't turn us on, they don't fill us with enthusiasm. So, dream big dreams if you like and focus on results, not activities. This is the key. Be clear about the results that you're trying to accomplish. This is one of the keys of peak performance, by the way. All peak performers are result-oriented. All losers, underachievers, tend to be activity-oriented. And in activity orientation, what they do is they work very, very hard. Sometimes they work frantically. Sometimes they work longer hours than you do. But they lose sight of the results. Ben Trigo, the strategic thinker, said the very worst thing in the world is to do very efficiently what need not be done at all. And many of us work very, very hard to do, very efficiently, what need not be done at all. Anybody who's ever had employees will tell you that every single day you come across your employees doing something very diligently, but it's completely irrelevant to the success of the business. So, focus on results. Here's a key question to ask yourself when in your working life. I think it's one of the most important key questions. I'll give you two. Number one is, what results are expected of me? Not what activities, but what results or what outputs. Well, what I supposed to produce in my job? 
A second question you can ask yourself is, why am I on the payroll? Why am I on the payroll? So I'm going to give you a simple word that you can use for the rest of your career, which will double your income. And the word is, how? From now on, whenever you have a goal, the only question you ask is, how? Whenever you have a problem to solve, the only question you ask is, how? If you have an obstacle to overcome, the only question you ask is, how? Now, the wonderful thing about the word how is that it triggers ideas. And the ideas are all for actions that you can take immediately. And when you take those ideas, you start to get feedback, which enables you to correct your course and take even better steps to achieve your goals. So the average person, when they have a problem, complains and blames other people about the problem. Top people, when they have a problem or goal, they simply say, how could I achieve this goal? And they try this and they try that and they try something else. But it never occurs to them that they will not eventually be successful. So they think about what they want and how to get it most of the time. The key to success is, first of all, understanding. And understanding is you. As understanding is understanding yourself and understanding your world. And that takes some time. It takes some study. And the second is effort. You have to work. You have to be willing to make the efforts necessary. When I began to study Spansky and Gorchev many years ago, they called it the work. And there's always work that you have to do. If you want to become physically fit, if you want to lose weight, there's a lot of work that you have to do. Unfortunately, most people, the bottom 80% of people, are lazy. Actually, there are three types of lazy. They're lazy, very lazy, and bone lazy. And one of the greatest problems we have in our society today is lazy people who want the rewards that hardworking people get. They call the lazy people the average person. They call the successful people the millionaires and billionaires without realizing that all of those people started with nothing. Many of them were poor. Many of them were poor. Many of them were immigrants. And it took them 20 to 30 years to become financially successful. There was a politician who ran for the presidency some years ago and he said, those who've been lucky at the gaming tables of life should be forced to share their winnings with those who have not been as fortunate. Uh, that's the mindset. In other words, if you're successful, it's just luck, you know. So therefore, you don't really deserve it. So it should be taken from you and given to others. The fact is that it takes tremendous effort for you and I to achieve any kind of success. But the fact is, that there are no obstacles standing between you and any goal that you can set for yourself. You just have to learn how to do it. Every single person who is successful today was once a failure. Everyone in the top 10% started in the bottom 10%. And they set very clear goals and they learned specific things and they did things differently from the average person. And their life took off like that Mercedes. Ben's touching on the gas pedal. Their lives changed. So sometimes the absence of one piece of knowledge can hold you back for years. And I say never allow yourself to be held back because of the absence of a piece of knowledge or skill. All business skills are learnable. All money making skills are learnable. All success skills are learnable. Everybody who knows them now at one time did not know them at all. And so you can learn anything you need to learn. Here's what we have found with regard to business. All business skills are learnable. You can learn any business skill that can help you to increase your earning ability. If you're in sales, you can learn any sales skill. If you want to earn money or make money, you can learn any money making skill. All business skills are learnable skills. Now you may not be able to play a violin like a great violinist or be a great athlete or a great athlete or a great artist because those are special skills. But in terms of business, you can learn any business skill because every person who has a business skill today at one time did not have that skill. And then they said that skill would help me. So they studied and practiced. And they took courses and they became good in that skill. I had a very poor education. So I thought other people were smarter than me. And if other people are smarter than you, it means that you are dumber than they are. And then I thought, 
Well, if they're smarter than me, then they're worth more than I am. But if other people are worth more, then you must be worth less. Now, the feeling of being worthless is the biggest single problem in the world today. The feeling of being not very valuable and not very important, which leads to low self-esteem, negativity, anger, and depression. It leads to giving up, not even trying. It's the biggest problem in the world today. And high self-esteem, confidence in yourself is the greatest blessing. But here's what I found. Nobody is smarter than you. Nobody's better than you. Some people have different talents and abilities, but talents and abilities. But talents and abilities are spread quite evenly. So you have more talent and ability than you could use in 100 lifetimes. The essence of all human wisdom is self-knowledge, and self-knowledge and self-understanding is to understand who you are, why you think and feel the way you do. Because that foundation is called interpersonal intelligence. It's been identified at Harvard as one of the foundation intelligences of great success in life. Really understanding yourself, understanding your strengths and weaknesses. You'll find that superior people are very honest about themselves. They know that they're not good at certain things and they're not defensive and they're not defensive and they're better at other things and they're quite proud of it if you look at all spiritual doctrines all religion all meditation all philosophy all great thought and all of history it is to bring people to the point of thinking where they enjoy complete peace of mind the rule is that if you set peace of mind as your highest goal you'll probably never make another mistake if you set peace of mind as your highest goal, everything else will fall into place. And if you achieve everything else in the world, but you do not achieve your own peace of mind, you will consider yourself a failure. You'll be unhappy, you'll be frustrated, you'll be irritated, you'll be irritated, you'll be angry, and so on. So peace of mind is the critical thing. And so you have to keep asking yourself, what are the things that occur that give me peace of mind? When do I enjoy the highest level of peace of mind? And when you start, when you have no fear and no negative emotions, your mind is like a vacuum. What flows in is complete peace. When you have solved all your problems but everything is fine, you just feel completely at peace. And those are what are called the peak experiences of your life. Those are when you are the happiest of all. And this is not something that occurs accidentally. You walk along and you trip over some peace of mind and pick it up and put it in your pocket. You have to deliberately design your life so that you feel a great sense of peace. And of course, an extension of that is happiness. Aristotle said the ultimate aim of all human behavior is to be happy, just to achieve your own happiness. When Anne Rand, a renowned materialist, said many years ago, she said the ultimate measure of how well you're doing as a human being is how genuinely happy you are. And if you can accomplish everything else in the world, but you're not a happy person and you don't enjoy inner peace, well then, to that degree you fail. You read these stories of people who are extremely successful, make an enormous amount of money, they snort coke, they drink themselves into oblivion, they go on tours around the country like Charlie Sheen, and then some of them go home and shoot themselves. And they've got all this money and all this fame and all this glory, but they have no sense of inner peace. So we have this little diagram here, internal versus external locus of control. This is what psychologists use. They say you have an internal locus of control here where you are happy and then you have a scale and you have an external locus of control. The internal locus of control is where you feel that you're in charge of your own life. You make your own decisions. Americans in general, by the way, have a much higher sense of inner control than most countries in the world. Europeans, 58% of the Germans, for example, in highly structured economies, believe that they have little or no control over their future. A person with an internal locus of control says, I make my own decisions. I am where I am, and what I am, and what I am, and what I am because of myself. I'm in charge of my life. A person with an external locus of control feels that other people are in charge of their life, their boss, their bills, and so on. Now you are here and you are moving in one direction or another with every decision that you make. The good news is that when you develop an internal locus of control, you feel really happy and strong, and you're much more positive and creative. And that's the goal that we're aiming for.
The people with a high internal locus of control feel really good about themselves. They feel powerful. They feel empowered. They feel strong. Here's an interesting point. You can never give away control except to other people. You can give away your control to other people, but you still remain responsible. So control begins with your thoughts, and your thoughts determine your feelings, and your feelings and your feelings then determine your actions. For the goals and ideals give you a sense of meaning and purpose. They make you wake up in the morning and you're excited you can hardly get going. There are a lot of people who love to sleep because they've got no reason to get up. People who are doing something and achieving something that's important, they look upon sleep as an irritation. It's something you have to do so that you're fully refreshed. But you do it as quickly as possible so you can get back to doing the stuff that makes you happy. It gives you peace of mind, fills your financial coffers and so on. There are several core areas that you must continually evaluate and assess. Number one is, what are your core competencies? What are you good at? Each individual or business starts off with a set of core skills or competencies that enable them to produce a product or service that the market wants, needs, and is willing to pay for. Each employee starts off with core competencies that enable them to make a contribution. Each company starts off with core competencies that enable them to survive and thrive in a competitive business market. The first question you must ask is, what is your company especially good at? What does your company do in an exceptional fashion? What are the special talents and skills and abilities of the people in your company that enable you to produce your products or services in a superior fashion? And remember, whatever got you to where you're at today is not enough to get you any further. If you're not continually upgrading your knowledge and skills in your core areas, you're actually falling behind. If you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Now, here's another question with regard to core capabilities. What are you personally very good at doing? Look upon yourself as a bundle of resources that could do a variety of things. What are your special, unique, individual talents and skills that enable you to do an excellent job and achieve a worthwhile result? Again, you must be continually adding to your skill base and upgrading your existing skills just to stay even in the current market. What additional competencies will you need as a business and as an individual in the future? What are the trends in your industry? What is it that customers will be wanting one year from today and what competencies will you have to develop in order to serve your customers at the highest possible level one year from today?